Order, please. I'd like to call the Standing Committee of Community Services uh, to order. Welcome everyone this morning. Um, uh, my name is Keith Irving. I'm the MLA for King South and also the chair of this committee. And uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started uh, uh, today. Uh, um, remind everyone to uh, put their phones on silent or vibrate. Um, so we don't interrupt proceedings. Um, should there be a, a reason to evacuate the building, uh, please exit to the Granville Street and then proceed to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and we'll gather in the courtyard. So I'd like to begin, first of all, by asking my uh, fellow committee members to introduce themselves and perhaps we'll start uh, to my left here, uh, Ms. Roberts. Good morning, welcome. I'm Lisa Roberts, CMLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning, my name is Steve Craig. I'm the MLA for sackville Cobequid. Good morning and welcome. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good morning, Bill Horn, M M MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank, and thank you all for coming today. Good morning, Brendan McGuire, MLA for Halifax Atlantic. Good morning, Brian Comer, MLA for Sydney River Meyer Lewisburg. Good morning and welcome, Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Centre. And uh, we're waiting on uh, Mr. Jessam, presumably he's just running a few minutes late and will join us shortly. Um, uh, just a reminder throughout the course of the meeting uh, to wait to be acknowledged by the chair so your mic can be activated and it helps us uh, with both Ledge TV and Hansard uh, to wait for the chair to recognize you. Um, and uh, again, with COVID, welcome Mr. Jessam. Uh, with COVID, uh, please keep your masks on during the meeting except when you are speaking um, and uh, remain in your seats as much as possible. So to accommodate that, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, as we have done in other committees to have a 15 minute break, approximately the one hour mark and then extend the meeting 15 minutes uh, uh, to 11.15 uh, or 11.18 now, based on our, uh, our start time here. Um, and uh, as well, the procedures in terms of flow of traffic are to enter through the center doors and exit through our two side doors here, uh, again, part of our COVID protocol. Um, so today we have uh, on our agenda officials from the uh, United Way of Cape Breton, the Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center and the Department of Community Services to discuss uh, child poverty in Cape Breton. And uh, uh, I'd like to ask the witnesses to begin by introducing themselves. Perhaps we'll start with DM Twill. Good morning, Deputy Minister Tracy Twill from the Department of Community Services. Good morning, Joy Knight, Executive Director of the Employment Support and Income Assistance Program. Good morning, I'm Joanna Latula Brochon with Cape Breton Family Place Resource Centre. And I'm Lynn McCarran, the Executive Director for United Way Cape Breton. Great, thank you. A pleasure to have you all here today. Um, just a, a caution for committee members and, and, and members of, uh, of our witness uh, uh, table here. Um, uh, one of the presentations had a series of stories about poverty and uh, uh, if, if you will have noticed, uh, there was a revision uh, that uh, came out yesterday. Um, uh, I asked the witness just to be very, very cautious with respect to the revealing of any information that would identify people that were cited in that. And thank you, uh, Ms. And I'm gonna work on your name here, uh, Ms. Latoupier. La Toupe Rochon. Um, thank you for doing that. And I just a uh, reminder to all committee members that we want to be cautious with respect to privacy uh, throughout the course of, uh, of the meeting. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, begin with the opening remarks from the witnesses. And perhaps we'll begin uh, with Ms. Macaron from, uh, I'm starting to say Macaron with a French accent here, um, uh, with the United Way uh, Cape Breton. Ms. McLaren. Good morning. Can everybody hear me or do I need to move closer? Can you hear? Okay. 
So I just turned my computer off because I thought I was going last, but that's okay. So it'll take a second for it to warm up. But um, I just wanted to say that uh, I've been the executive director for United Way Cape Breton for approximately going nine years, ten, almost ten years. Um, and I came from a nonprofit background, so I've always worked in the nonprofit sector with. Um, can't hear? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I can keep going. I just, I saw you raise your hand, so I wasn't sure. So, uh, yeah, my background is in the nonprofit sector. I've worked with uh, adults with disabilities. I've worked with children with disabilities, young offenders, and so forth. So the reason I joined United Way was because I thought that the nonprofit sector needed uh, a voice of experience, and if we could just tell our stories as the nonprofit sector, the money would flow, and it would just be that simple. Anyway, of course, it's not quite that simple, and my computer is completely frozen. Um, <laughs> power of technology. So yeah, so I've been with United Way and, and uh, trying to, to work with different organizations across the, 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 the counties, across the, all of Cape Breton, to make sure that we work together to um, highlight the, the strengths of the communities and highlight the strengths of the organizations to, in order to be able to generate new revenue, whether it's through corporate, business, government, and so forth. So. Okay, I'm going to have to wing it. Um, so basically, what we've done is we've invested in uh, programs that are helping move people out of poverty through housing stability, financial security, um, employment programs. We are also um, investing in children and youth programs, helping them engage in learning, con connect it th to their communities, and, and help them feel part of, of their communities in a way that uh, is more meaningful to them from your early age right up to, to high school. I don't know what's going on with this computer. It's a very pretty picture. I'm sorry, it's frozen. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to invest in, in different organizations and make sure that they have the, the proper resources to be able to expand and work with different uh, with, with their programs and help build capacity within those communities. One of the things that we are really good at doing is collaborating. So we collaborate with different organizations, bring them together and share resources, share expertise, share experiences, and, and help be able to, to build on each other's strengths and make sure that they are, are working to, to, the, to the best of their ability. One of the things that we noticed with COVID was that a lot of organizations are very volunteer-led, very grassroots organizations, and they had some great difficulty in... Um, Order, please, Ms. Coombs. I was, no, I was talking to you. <laughs> Two questions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Karen. Okay. So one of the things that we found was that a lot of these volunteer-led organizations had to shut down when COVID happened. Um, they didn't have the policies, the protocol, the procedures, all of the things that they needed in place. They were volunteer-led, a lot of them senior organizations, and as a result, just closed and didn't know how to get back up and running. So one of the things that we found we needed to do at United Way was make sure that we could get these things back running up to, as quickly as possible. We had a lot of Zoom meetings and brought people together. Um, a couple of different organizations had the capacity and had the strengths, and the, the, so they had the, the ability to, to do the, the policies and procedures, and we shared all of them with the organizations that didn't have them, and so that they could get back up and running, and anything that they needed to do. So one of the things that, one of the programs that we invest in at United Way is a good food bus, um, and that's bringing, because we have food deserts in, in, in throughout Cape Breton, and so bringing local affordable food to different communities because transportation is also an issue. With COVID, we had to shut down the bus because we couldn't have food going to different communities, but what we did was we created a good food packs. And so what happened then was that that same organization, New Dawn, Meals on Wheels, um, they had a, a dietitian on staff, they created good food packs and made them available to all the nonprofit organizations across Cape Breton. So if you needed, all you needed to do was order the good food packs. They were either uh, for single family, single person household or family household, and you could, um, and, they, and they could, order them from them, we would pay the invoices, 
and all we had to worry about was then delivery. And even at that, we had some organizations that stepped up and said, look, we're closed, but we have a van, so if you need us for anything, any help. So we even facilitated organizations that weren't involved in the food security to help with the transportation piece, bringing the, the good food packs from New Dawn to Eskasoni, for example, or, or whatever the case may be. So that was one of the things that we were able to do, was to facilitate, because we had the connections to all the nonprofit sector. The other thing that we noticed was um, immediately was that the internet was an issue. A lot of people didn't have the internet, so they didn't have access to resources. They didn't know that you know, things were moving online and they were moving online very quickly, but people weren't able to, to, to get online, people that didn't have internet. And the places that have offered free internet, like the library and the Tim Hortons and the bus, for example, that all had free Wi-Fi, were all shut down so they didn't have access. So we started working with uh, Canadian Mental Health Nova Scotia to try and provide funding and had a call, public call for, for people who needed internet and made sure that they were were provided access. We're still having difficulty with that. Some areas are not covered geographically, as, as probably you know. Um, and I know that the government is working on that, making sure that those areas are, are, are kind of getting ramped up. But a lot of them were just, they were in communities that had at, were able to have it and just couldn't afford it. So we were, we, we are, we have, with the federal funding that we, we got, we were able to, uh, to fund all of those uh, up until the end of March and that's the, the federal funding guidelines. That's the other thing about United Way, is we were able to be a resource for the federal government to say, okay, we want to put money in Cape Breton, how are we going to do that? And so it all came to us. So federal money, provincial money, municipal money, and, and we could leverage some of that to make sure that we have more. Um, through, through this as well, we also started, um, we had a lot of people calling up looking to volunteer, so we created an online virtual tutoring program. So, f so for kids who were learning from home, then we could do free internet um, learning that works for the, the folks that have internet, but you know, so we're in the process of making sure that that happens. We do hear stories of people that, you know, like they couldn't access um, their AA meetings because they moved virtually. And so now they're at risk of, they're, they're isolated, they're, they, they're, they're calling me saying, is there something you can do to help me? We also have people, children, um, social workers calling us because children have received a Chromebook but can't use it at home because they don't have internet. So those are the kinds of things that we're trying to, to do to make sure that we're, we're working together to get these folks what they need. Um, and you know, we do have a large portion of our, our funding comes from, from corporate. A large portion, come, and you can see that in the slides that I don't have in front of me, so I can't give you the exact numbers. But a large par portion comes from, from corporate, special events, individual giving, but there's 11% that comes from other, and that would be a foundations, grants, government funding that we would use. We, use, uh, we have summer students that help us out. Um, just so you know, we're only a, an office staff of three, so facilitating wh what we need to do and how we need to do it is sometimes quite challenging. So we do access funding support for summer students and co-op students, and they come in and help us to facilitate. So for example, it was our summer students that got the online tutoring up and running and, and recruited the volunteers and got all of that. And, and then worked with the, uh, collected the information for the folks that needed the internet and then facilitate that information through Can Canadian Mental Health with the local service, internet service providers, and we provided devices for fr free and things like that. So facilitating all of that um, requires a lot of legwork, and so we were able to access um, some funding support for our summer students um, to be able to help us out with that. I know I only have five minutes, so I'm, 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 I'm not sure if I'm where I'm at. But I could keep I could keep going for hours, so I just want uh, to... You're over five, five okay, minutes. so I can stop. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, thank you very much. We'll now move on to opening comments from uh, Ms. Uh, La Tulip Rochon. That was just about perfect. Thank you for that. Everybody knows me as Joanna because of that name. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today to, to bring you a perspective on child poverty in Cape Breton. Um, Family Place is an organization that's been up and running for about 27 years, and I've been there for that full period of time. We're working with about 3,573 individuals across Cape Breton Island, and our programs and services are, are really very focused on trying to reach the most vulnerable of families. There's so many things that, that could and should be said when one has an opportunity to come forward in a form such as this. And I thought that after a few quick statistics that most likely are familiar to you, I, I'd spend most of the five minutes sharing the impact of poverty uh, to paint the picture, if you will, of what child poverty means for those today that we're working with and aware of on Cape Breton Island. 
We certainly know that children don't earn income. They live in poverty because their parents are struggling to survive, um, given the low-income circumstances that they're experiencing. And statistically, when we look at figures from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, we recognise that 36.6% of the children living in poverty within the federal riding of Sydney, Victoria, and there's 26.9% uh, of children living impoverished lives within Cape Breton Council riding, and pardon me for using the federal ridings, but they were the ones that I had the, um, the strongest statistics for. From a, a, a quite a disturbing low of 17.2% of children living in poverty in our Shetkamp area to a decimating high of 73.2% in Escazoni. Too many children doing without the very, very basics that others may take for granted as we live, work and play on our beautiful island. Nova Scotia has the third highest child poverty rate in Canada, the highest rate in Atlantic Canada as per the last child poverty report card. I, I'm not sure, but I think perhaps we allow the situation to continue because we're not familiar with the impact of poverty on our young families and diving into the heart of that matter is really quite uncomfortable and it, it's very heartbreaking. They're difficult conversations, but it's, it's really my belief that until we understand the face of poverty, until we understand it in very real terms, we may not be inspired to do what I recognize is a very difficult work to eradicate its existence. So some examples of the work that we're involved with. I feel like it's a double blind study now because there were certainly identities protected before and doubly protected now to be overly cautious and respectful of people's privacy. So working with a rural dad whose children were removed to the, uh, from the care of their mother while he himself was incarcerated. Um, being back in our general population now, he's trying to get his home ready for his children to return, as he recognizes the need for appropriate furnishings and other child-related needs. He's attempting himself to live on a single person's income assistance. He's often hungry when he comes to our programs. We recognize that what we're serving as snack is actually a meal for him. He's made significant progress and happy to report that the ongoing plan from a child protection perspective is for the family to be reunified and for his children to come back. So he's very focused on that, yet very conscious that he doesn't want to give any sort of reason, if you will, for uh, our child welfare folks to be uncomfortable or to change their mind. So with that, he's doing without food and he's doing without oil to try to save every penny he can to purchase things that he needs for his children. And this is the only way that he has found to access funds to slowly get him what his young family needs. Reference prior to transportation. Sad, sad situations, not only without lacking lots of public transit um, on our island, but certainly when we hear multiple participants reporting that in fact they feel forced to perform sexual favors to pay for trips to the grocery store or to get their children to medical appointments. When you live in rural communities, transportation issues are very limiting and they're certainly not easily resolved. Oftentimes, and certainly this time of year, we have families dealing with rodent issues. And it gets so bad for one of our families that, that rats actually climbed onto counters and ate the food that was out defrosting for the family meal. When we connected with that family to discuss the issue, you know, the, the landlord was not willing to send an exterminator in because the landlord had had a previous bad experience in the year prior and so was not going to pay exterminators to come in. And so we stepped in to cover that cost. The exterminator reported to the family and through the family to us that there were several generations of rats living in that apartment building. Her child gets so depressed with the living arrangements, doesn't want to go to school, and the child went to school and reported to a guidance counselor that he was feeling suicidal and ended up moving out of the family home to live with a neighbor. The mother was devastated, feeling totally unable to provide care for her children. 
conscious of the time, but not trying to rush through these situations, we can talk about Jane, who's a mother of three. She's living separate from her partner and her children. She has access visits with the middle child, and she's challenged to try to understand the difficult physical and emotional road her youngest child, along with other transgender people, have to travel to become the person they always knew they were. Jane suffers with mental health issues, which leave her unable to consistently maintain or at times even leave her very small apartment. And at times, when her mental health spirals out of control, she's unable to maintain the required contact with service providers. And this results in reduced or the elimination of benefits that are normally accessible to her. The family often experience food insecurity. The loss of internet, the lack of minutes on a telephone exasperates this situation. She's experiencing much, by the way, of parental stress, strife, and confusion in a situation that over and over again increases her level of mental unwellness. We can go on to other generations and talk about Denise as a grandmother. We have lots of grandparents um, providing primary care for grandchildren. In her situation, a number of the children are still in school. One has identified special needs. She's on a fixed income, being a senior. She's separated from a partner living in a small rental unit and doesn't always have access to transportation. Things like school supplies and clothing for growing children are huge challenges for her. And through our program experience with her, we learn that she often goes without food and without the very basics of things that she would need to make more available for the children she cares for. She came to be the primary caregiver of her grandchildren after a family separation related to unaddressed addictions issues. Joseph is a father and a primary caregiver of his two young children. Occasionally, he also parents a third child who he understands to need such support. Addictions has played a significant role in the breakup of his partnership and continue to have an impact on the children's lives. He works full time, but he works full time for minimum wage, and his wages don't meet the needs of his family. So he finds himself dependent on the financial help of his aging parents support that they can little afford to give. Food insecurity, inconsistent access to reliable transportation, the cost of educational and recreational opportunities are just some of the poverty-related challenges that Joseph faces as he puts forward his best efforts to support his family. Certainly recognizing that I was invited here today to specifically speak to our Cape Breton experience, but in no way do I want to diminish the experiences of children and their families from all across Nova Scotia. While this is a problem perhaps heightened in Cape Breton, it isn't one that stops at the Canso Causeway. And how many more children are going to be left behind before we will make it our collective priority to end child poverty? Think about things like a living wage, food security, accessible, affordable, appropriate housing, quality childcare, access to internet, telephones, public transit, and focus supports for our Indigenous communities. These are places to begin or places that we must continue our efforts if we really are focused on doing right by our youngest citizens. Very quickly in closing, I want to acknowledge a conversation that I had the pleasure of having with our deputy and her colleagues um, to try to get to the heart of some of these matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Latulip Rochon. Uh, now to uh, Deputy Minister Twill. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, thank you for having us back again. It's a pleasure to see you all again and for the invitation to speak on this complex and very important topic. I'm very pleased to be here with my colleague Joy Knight and I'm equally pleased to be here with two really important key community partners in United Way and Family Place. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the incredible work that these two organizations do and the important role that they play in the fabric that is required to support both children and families living in poverty in this province. And we are very thankful for the work that they do every day. As this committee would be aware, at the Department of Community Services, we have been working to change our systems and programs to be less reactive and to place more emphasis early before families reach a crisis point. 
This approach also extends to the investments we are making to interrupt the cycle of poverty so that families and their children can build the kind of lives they want for decades to come. I think it's important to note that not every family living in poverty is on the DCS caseload. In fact, many are not, and we still need to support them by building community programs that can help when and where they need it. I am consistently impressed by both our staff's commitment to the people we serve and the number of community organizations dedicated to supporting those in poverty, particularly children. In Cape Breton, the topic of today's discussion, communities are very close-knit and, and that community support is particularly profound in that area. Poverty with a focus on child poverty is a problem too significant and too complex for government to fix on its own. We must work closely with communities, with community groups, across government and with families themselves. Poverty, poverty rates in Nova Scotia are 13.3% and have been slowly but steadily declining since 2008. Child poverty sits at about 24% across the province. That rate goes up by nearly 10% in Cape Breton. It is a heartbreaking reality and there are no simple solutions or quick fixes. Child poverty is a complex issue and is frequently intergenerational and systemic and is often rooted in trauma, racism, mental health issues and addictions. I'm here today to assure you that my department is fully committed to this work. Over the last several years, we have put measures in place to put more money directly into the hands of families who need it. This helps parents support their children now while we find ways to help them build the futures they want for themselves and their children. This year, for example, government invested $18 million in the Nova Scotia Child Benefit. This is the largest increase for families since the Child Benefit was created in 1998. It puts hundreds of dollars more per month in the hands of families who need it most, and more families are now eligible. For example, a family of five, two parents and three children, earning $30,000 a year, were ineligible for the benefit before the change. Now they will receive $1,750 more per year. In addition, with this expansion, more children are eligible for drug coverage under the low-income pharmacare program. Through the program, families pay $5 per prescription. This tax-free monthly benefit began in July 2020, and we estimate almost 28,000 families and 49,000 children will now be receiving the Nova Scotia Child Benefit. We have also introduced the standard household rate, which is the largest increase to the income assistance budget in Nova Scotia's history. This means everyone who receives this, receives this rate gets the maximum amount. Before this change, people had to live within specific budget amounts based on their household size and their actual costs. Now with the standard household rate providing a flat rate based on household size, people choose how they allocate their money between shelter, food and other expenses. For some who are able to find housing at a lower rate, this means more money for food or other expenses. Child support payments are now exempt from income assistance calculations. We know that children in single parent families, particularly those led by single mothers, are more likely to live in poverty. This one change puts, puts an average of $322 more per month into those parents' pockets. Food security is also a critically important issue. Government is supporting access to healthy, nutritious food in Victoria County, Cape Breton, and in other communities through the Community Food Literacy and Access Fund. There are healthy eating programs in schools across the province. We've introduced grants for community-led anti-poverty initiatives, and they are supporting projects like the African Nova Scotian Freedom School, the Boys and Girls Club and Whitney Pier Youth Club, and the Cape Breton Transportation Social Innovation Lab. Tackling poverty also requires wraparound supports for families and children that will interrupt or disrupt the cycle of poverty for future generations. This means support with childcare and educational funding for their parents. It may mean help with transportation costs and career supports and recognizing cultural and systemic barriers. We believe in supporting families early before they are in crisis. This includes intensive supports for families, like our Families Plus program in New Glasgow and Cape Breton. 
It also includes support for the important work done by family resource centers like the Cape Breton Family Place, who know their families and their needs so well. Our Parenting Journey Home Visitation Program works collaboratively with families to identify their challenges and how best to overcome them. Poverty is a complex problem that requires a cross-government approach. We work closely with other departments who also offer critical supports for families. For example, the Universal Pre-Primary Program is now in place in every school across the province. Pre-primary students can take, take the school bus and before and after school programs are offered at 34 pre-primary sites. The new Canada-Nova Scotia Housing Benefit offers support for those struggling to afford housing, up to $448 a month for renters and $200 a month for homeowners. That is not included in our income assistance calculations. In the last two years, government has increased childcare subsidy rates so that kids can get quality preschool learning and quality childcare gives parents the chance to perhaps improve their education or enter the workforce. Poverty is complex and it cannot be solved by one department alone, nor can it be addressed solely through funding. Rather, it takes a focused and sustained commitment to make real change that seeks to address the root causes of poverty. We know, I know, there is a lot more work to do. We are focused on our clients' needs and making it easier for them to access our help, rather than making their needs fit into our processes. And we are focused on finding solutions for the many hardworking families in need of support. We are also committed to working in partnerships with organizations like United Way and Family Place Resource Centre. We recognize that our mutual clients sometimes feel a power imbalance when thinking about interacting with our department and with government organizations. And while our staff do everything they can to build relationships with our clients, we count on our partners who often have a different relationship with our clients than we do to bring their needs to our attention when people don't feel they can approach us directly. These partnerships are critical, not only because of the important services these agencies provide, but also because together we can ensure that people are receiving the right package of supports and help show them that we are indeed working together. We believe in them and we want them to have a better future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tweel. Uh, so we'll now move to questions uh, from the committee. Uh, I'm recommending that we qu have questions until 11, allowing us a bit of time uh, for uh, wrap-up comments and, and then a little bit of committee business. Uh, so right now I have uh, eight folks on the list, uh, including Ms. Coombs, with three questions. Uh, so um, we're going to uh, do one and a supplementary, but I'm going to try to gauge the time so that we can get uh, everyone in if I can. So let's start with uh, Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for the information you provided so far. And it just uh, um, it's difficult sometimes to think about a child going hungry. So uh, I do also want to ask, um, how do you define? Poverty. I, I come from a different country, and I'm assuming the definition of poverty is, is a national to Canada. And how does that work um, in other countries? If, if where do we stand, uh, and what is the definition of poverty here? Thank you, Ms. Ms. Twill. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, you are correct. There is a national uh, standard known as the market basket measure um, that nationally we look to Statistics Canada to provide us with census data and income data measured against basically a basket of services and um, products that families need to purchase. The rate of poverty varies, or the measure varies from province to province based on the cost of living in the respective province that you're measuring uh, the poverty rates within. Uh, from a low income perspective, um, families are considered to be, live families and individuals are considered to be living in poverty if they are 50% below the low income cutoff level for the particular jurisdiction within which they live. Supplementary, Ms. De Costanzo. Uh, sure. Another item that I was really thinking about is the child tax benefits. The, the federal has that. Have you seen a big um, difference? Uh, because to me, is 
I know that it has made a, a big difference to the families, the, the refugee families that I worked with, and the number of kids that they have. Has that made a big difference in Cape Breton as well? Ms. Twill. Thank you again for the question. Uh, I would say yes, it has made a difference. Um, I wish it had made a bigger difference, but I think um, the fact it, it has it has had an impact uh, in combination with the Nova Scotia Child Benefit, we should see an, a bigger impact. I guess um, it really your question really does speak to the complexity of poverty and the circumstances within which many families in this province who are living in poverty find themselves. That. Um, very complex mix of intergenerational poverty. Um, often there is intergenerational trauma, mental health and addictions issues. Um, there may be um, racism, systemic racism at play. There are a number of challenges that many families face. And while the Canada um, Child Benefit, as well as the Nova Scotia Child Benefit, are positive steps in the right direction, increasing those rates are positive steps in the right direction, Research would indicate that the, the biggest indicator of whether or not a family will live in poverty or an individual will live in, will live in poverty is if their family, if their parents lived in poverty, which tells us that we need to really disrupt that cycle of poverty. Um, and, and the way to do that, we believe, is in working in partnership with our community partners, such as Family Place and others, to um, disrupt that cycle of poverty through um, significant by making significant impacts through things like, for example, universal pre-primary, through making post-secondary more accessible um, for families through some of the supports that we can provide through employment support. Um, and uh, quite simply, uh, and this is a very complex problem, so I don't want to sound like I'm oversimplifying this at all, sometimes um, for children, who have not had role models, who don't believe that they can achieve more because they've not um, felt that they've been believed in because of per perhaps intergenerational trauma in their family, involvement perhaps with child welfare. Sometimes having someone believe in them, whether that individual works at the Family Place Resource Centre, um, works with United Way, or is a caseworker with community services, sometimes having someone believe in them and seeing what is actually possible can make a fundamental difference in the life of that child and put them on a path to a better future. That's not to say that supports um, putting um, more income in the hands of families now isn't important. It is absolutely important. Hence the in increased investment in the Nova Scotia Child Benefit and the changes made around standard household rate, um, changes made around basic personal amount from an income tax perspective. All of those changes will help, but with without wraparound supports that acknowledge the complexity of the issue, um, we will not get at some of the root causes. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Ms. Coombs. Thank you um, all for being here. My question is for the department. You've said multiple times in your answers, uh, poverty is a complex issue. I disagree. I think it's only a complex issue because we have a government who has refused to make the multiple and concurrent necessary investments. In the most recent budget, the government prioritized 70 million corporate dollar tax cut at a time when we have the lowest medium, medium tax income in Canada and the highest rate of food insecurity of any province. The first report card on the child and family poverty in Nova Scotia was released by the CCPA in 2001. Since then, they have issued annual reports based on research, which have all made similar recommendations, including increasing income assistance to adequate levels tied to living costs, establishing a system of universal, accessible, affordable childcare, and ensuring workers have access to fair wages. And we heard today in what we heard today in the presentation from the Cape Breton Family Place Resource Center that what is needed is a living wage accessible, affordable, appropriate housing, quality childcare, access to internet, telephones, public transit, and a focused supports for Indigenous communities. And I will add as well, appropriate 
mental health, and addiction health care. So my question is, what, what was the rationale within the department behind the decision not to address the recommendations coming out of a decade of existing research? Ms. Twill. Thank you very much for your question. Um, and so I'll, uh, there was a lot in your preamble, so I will try to go through some of your preamble and respond to your question. So I would respectfully disagree that we have not um, address those recommendations. We haven't addressed them in full, absolutely not. Um, and I'm not here today, and I, and I hope my remarks were very clear in that. I'm not here today to um, try to say that these rates aren't significant and that they don't require um, an increased focus. What I am here today to say is we are working collaboratively in ways that we've not worked before, to be perfectly frank, with community and across government to look at the levers that government has, but also to take into account the strengths that communities have as well in terms of working collaboratively with us. Part of the work in the $20 million poverty reduction blueprint is to look at different ways to tackle this challenge that speak to some of the root causes that I spoke to earlier. Um, so I'll try to work through some of um, the comments that you made. So I've already referenced the Nova Scotia Child Benefit. The Nova Scotia Child Benefit is a, represents an $18 million increase in that benefit, the first increase since 1998, as I referenced earlier. Puts an extra, th a, a minimum of $300 in the pockets of, of uh, parents who qualify for that and now more parents qualify um, for that. 49,000 children will now receive the Nova Scotia Child Benefit um, within their family. I referenced the basic personal amount changes. Those changes were made a few years ago, increasing the basic personal amount to just over uh, $11,000. That means fewer people now actually pay um, personal income tax, which has a significant impact on them. We've also exempted child support payments, um, which has an impact for those families, particularly single mothers, um, who were not receiving, um, first of all, not receiving their child maintenance payments, but also it was factored into their income assistance calculations. So that has, as well has made a difference. We've doubled the allowable asset allowance. It is now $2,000 per per individual, $4,000 per family, which allows families to have more assets and still receive income assistance. The poverty reduction credit has also doubled from $250 to $500, and the income threshold will increase with this current uh, tax year to $16,000. We've also put in place, you, I'm sure you're familiar, an earned income exemption schedule, which allows our clients to keep more of the money that they earn. We're seeing very positive impacts from the earned income exemption. Um, and in Cape Breton, in fact, we see many more of our clients are now working because there is an income exemption schedule that makes sense, so they can actually earn income and keep more of their income. You would probably be familiar with some of the work that my colleagues at the Department of Housing have rolled out as well. Um, so they are looking at housing stability and have um, hired more housing support workers. We now have the Canada Nova Scotia Targeted Housing Benefit, which likewise is exempt from income assistance calculations. Um, sorry, I've, I've lost my note here in my, the next place I was going to go in my comment. Oh, and we also have a provincially funded housing locator um, through AHANS to help bring about some stability in the housing situation, which is a very real challenge in the province, no question. From a transportation perspective, we are working collaboratively with our colleagues in communities, culture, and heritage on a transportation strategy for the province, recognizing that um, the transportation challenges in Cape Breton are different than the transportation challenges in other parts of the province and requires, require a different solution. Um, and the, I guess the last point I'll make, uh, which really comes back to the, my earlier comment about wraparound support. Through this year's budget, we also increased investment in prevention and early intervention initiatives through our Child, Youth and Family Services Division. That prevention and early intervention work seeks to work with families 
early so that um, we better understand what their needs are. We provide them with the supports that they need so that they can be on a surer footing to either um, employment or whatever other stability and supports that that family needs um, in order to be successful and to care for their children. No family wants to, to live in poverty, and we don't want that either. And so we're working hard to, to try to alleviate poverty where it exists and prevent it from occurring um, in the first place through these wraparound supports. Supplementary, Ms. Coombs. Thank you very much. Um, you'll have to excuse me because I have one in three, one in two actually, in my constituency living in poverty. So this is a very important issue with, in, in, in my constituency uh, and across Cape Breton with one in three. Also in your presentation, you also indicate that there is a poverty reduction work happening across government with many departments focused on supporting low-income Nova Scotian families and children. Unfortunately, we don't have an overall plan, a clear goals, targets, timelines. Well, targets and timelines are very important when it comes to poverty elimination. So. Talking, so talking in terms of poverty reduction rather than poverty, so what is the concept for you to talk in terms of poverty reduction rather than looking at poverty elimination when we know that here in Nova Scotia there's enough to go around and we could, we could in fact eliminate the problem of poverty. So why are we talking, why is the department talking in terms of just lessening it rather than eliminating it? Ms. Twill. Thank you for the question. And I apologize if I've left you with an impression that I don't want to eliminate poverty. I want to eliminate poverty. I would suggest that all of my colleagues here today want to eliminate poverty. The path to elimination is to reduce the rates of poverty on the road to elimination. So I'm with you 100%. And um, you know, please don't apologize for being passionate about this issue. Quite frankly, um, I think part of our challenge is that not enough people are passionate about this issue. This is a collective issue. It is not just a government issue. It is a community issue, but I would argue it's also an individual issue. Every citizen in this province has, an, has a, a role to play. And recognizing that poverty, seeing poverty, calling it out, recognizing that it exists, in my view, is part of our as part of our challenge. It's very easy to turn a blind eye to those families and individuals who are living in poverty and to just kind of walk by. Um, and we can't do that. It, it, we need business involved. We need government. We need community. We need all of us involved. Um, so if I left you with an impression that I'm only seeking to kind of nip at the edges, that is not accurate. We are seeking to eliminate poverty. The work that we um, have been doing over the last four years through the Poverty Blueprint um, has been looking at trying different, um, different um, efforts, trying different initiatives, working with different community organizations, and looking at the voice of community and families living in poverty to try to come up with other um, initiatives, other efforts, other ways we can begin to tackle poverty. We are four years into the five-year poverty reduction blueprint. The evaluation results are coming in um, and are basically affirming some of the challenges that we we knew existed. So reliable transportation is critically important and something that we will need a strong strategy around. Um, ensuring that wraparound supports are available for families with very complex needs um, that speaks to um, you know, some of the intergenerational challenges that they may have experienced that they require support to deal with, as well as some of the fundamental changes brought about by things like changes in the Nova Scotia Child Benefit, changes in income assistance rates. Um, the Canada Child Benefit is, certainly plays a role here. So we absolutely are working to eliminate poverty working to reduce that number on the road to elimination. The poverty reduction blueprint is showing us some very uh, interesting potential projects that could spread province-wide. We'll have more information on the poverty blueprint uh, within the next year or so as that uh, funding comes to an end. And we look to take those evaluation results um, and come forward with some recommendations to government. 
Let's move to Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome, all of you, and thank you for the work that you are collectively and individually doing to address the issue of child poverty here in Nova Scotia. I think individually, everybody has an interest, as you indicated, Ms. Tweel, in that. So I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, Ms. McCarran, the work that you do to take the funds and to distribute them throughout the Cape Breton and to realize the needs and that funding and going searching for sources is, uh, is, is very important work, and I wish you continued success in that. Ms. Latulip Rochon, um, thank you for your decades of work in this area. I reflect on the comment you made about the individual who was um, coming out of incarceration. I remember back in the 80s when my mother was very involved and my family's very involved in helping those in poverty and there was a man who was being incarcerated. His wife and the four young children had no place to live. And I remember mom calling me and said, Stephen, can you get a truck? Can you get a truck? We have some people to help and we help those people who were in need at that time. So individually, we all have a role to play here to do this. I want to uh, basically recognize too that organizations that are out there, especially during COVID, are having great difficulty. Seniors, the COVID restrictions, youth, everybody is facing a challenge right now. And I'd like to turn my attention to the Department of Community Services. Individually, we can make a difference. And I don't want to talk about, please, uh, all the social determinants and the big grandiose, the grandiose um, plans and, and initiatives that are under, underway here. I want to talk about the individual caseworker, the social worker in Department of Community Services who works with those who are vulnerable, who works with organizations to support organizations. I believe government has a role to play when community cannot step up. So we have community organizations who do not have the people that they need now. They may have some money. It's easy to throw money. Money doesn't solve a problem. It's what you do with it that solves an issue. So how are your staff working with organizations and individuals you'd indicate earlier to break the cycle of poverty, intergenerational, we need to be able to get in there and do something. Well, we can't get in there with a program if we don't have people and we don't have staff who are engaged and working with people. And that's what I'd like you to focus on in your response. How are your individual social workers, your case workers, how have they been impacted by COVID? Because I'm hearing that they're not out there. When we need to have people out there talking and working to help support organizations and individuals, recognizing that your workers do as well require supports. And I, I suspect the stress in, the, in your department from time to time is quite high. It probably was pre-COVID pre and even more so now because they've got the heart too. They want to do the right thing to help our people. So I'd like you to address right now with COVID, what has changed in the ability of your social workers, your case workers to get out into the field and have those meaningful discussions with the people who are impacted by poverty, and especially in Cape Breton and child poverty in Cape Breton. DM Twill. Thanks very much for your question. Um, I couldn't agree more. The social workers and, and case workers in the department care a lot, um, and frequently, um, yeah, they, they do carry a lot of stress. There's no question about it because they do become very personally invested in many of their cases and they want to see families succeed and individuals succeed. So absolutely, they carry a lot. Um, during COVID, um, the Department of Community Services, all of our offices remained open. We moved to, we, so we did not send all of our employees to work from home. We moved to a rotating vital team schedule where we constantly had staff working in the office so that if we did have clients that came to the office, there was someone on site to receive them. Those that worked from home um, were set up to fully and completely work from home. And 
then moved to, um, so this is during the first wave of COVID, many of our caseworkers moved to providing more intensive support over the phone than they, they normally would have, you know, booked an appointment, the client would come into the office, they'd meet face to face. Um, so we moved to more phone service when it comes to some of our caseworkers on the income assistance and employment support side, certainly. Um, Moving to more phone service actually, in, um, in, in a strange way, actually seems to have enhanced relationships in some respects because um, many of our clients have, uh, and I alluded to this in my opening remarks, many of our clients are very, and understandably so, anxious to come into a DCS office, to meet with their caseworker. Um, they're, they're quite anxious about that, nervous about that being able to talk to their caseworker over the phone at a time that was convenient for them. So many of our caseworkers talk to their clients into the evenings after they put their children to bed or after they'd, you know, maybe worked a short shift earlier in the day. They, we met them more where they were, I would say, during that period of time versus asking them to come in at a set time, one o'clock Tuesday, come into our office. We were much more flexible in terms of how we connected with them. Um, in light of everything that COVID was bringing and the increased flexibility that working and supporting them over the phone provided. With regards to child welfare and child protection, our child protection social workers um, were out in the field, did conduct home visits, um, were very active during COVID, they worked, um, they, they did not always work out of the office. They worked out of their homes with all the pr appropriate technological supports and protections, but they did still do um, home visits. They did um, go out and see their clients and or they moved visits to other modes of technology. Um, so for access visits, for example, um, for children who reside with a foster parent, some foster parents were not not comfortable having um, other people come into their home during COVID. And so we provided, in some instances, um, iPads to foster families so that we could do virtual visits for those children with their biological parents or significant other family member that needed to have contact with them. Uh, so I would say that social workers went above and beyond to ensure that there was a consistency of presence there for all of those children in care and for any families that were in crisis continued to um, do the appropriate home visits while making sure that uh, COVID protocols per public health were absolutely respected to ensure that in no way was a social worker um, putting any family at risk by them entering a home and likewise that we were not having our social worker at risk by entering a home where um, there may be there may be illness in that home so we looked at all kinds of creative options to make sure visits continued i'll give you one example um, to ensure visits happened one of our uh, offices actually went out and purchased pop-up tents that could be set up in a park so that visits could still be, could still happen with appropriate social distancing outside with kind of the air moving through the pop-up tent. Um, so I would say, I'm sorry, uh, your comment about you're hearing that people aren't getting out. Um, that they have, the social workers did have a very strong presence and um, and our client, we've heard very positive feedback from many of our clients about how they did go uh, above and beyond. And I, I, I was blown away throughout the entire, I mean, I've always been impressed. During COVID, I was doubly impressed. And as they've now returned to a more regularized um, routine and um, are kind of back in the office and, and as I say, back in a more regular routine, I am even more impressed with the diligence with which they are approaching their work and their desire to ensure that there is an inc increased flexibility in how we work with our clients. And so I guess the last point I would make is um, this committee is certainly aware of the transformation efforts that took place, have, have been taking place in the Department of Community Services prior to um, my arrival in the department. 
through COVID, I, COVID was um, like a rapid fire opportunity to learn about how to be flexible and how to um, meet, really meet clients where they are. And so some of our learnings from COVID, we are looking at how we can adapt those for our systems moving moving forward so that we are more flexible. There had already been changes made. I think COVID has shone a spotlight on the fact that um, in order to have a really significant impact, which is what we all want, we need to bring, continue to bring flexibility and client-focused, human-centered um, focus to all of our work. Oh, thank you. We've reached the one hour point, so I guess it's time for our break. I just want to uh, mention to folks we've got through uh, two and a half questions. I've got another eight people on the list, so we're going to have to do a little better in, with the preambles and a little bit shorter on the questions, but uh, I don't want to uh, uh, discourage uh, thoughtful responses, but uh, we've got a long list here. So let's take a 15-minute break, and we'll return at uh, uh, 10, oh, uh, 10 17. The committee is recessed.
for this supplementary for Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Wheel. Thank you very much for those responses. Um, you know, certainly the transformation of the department is something that I questioned when I f first was elected. And then when I found out it was to be client or customer centric, I was quite surprised because I always thought it ought to have been. So that, uh, that, was, a, that was a revelation for me. The you know, moving and adjusting with COVID and the reality of the way we do business is very important and I'm glad to see that the, the department has done that and that uh, it doesn't always though replace that in-person touch for sure. I, I, we all recognize that. You had mentioned about iPads for foster parents and uh, in Cape Breton, we know that the, the internet is not widely available However, too, even if it is, people do not often have the devices with which to access it, to communicate with your staff or your staff or your staff. And I'm just wondering, what is the plan to promote or to facilitate those of low income in Cape Breton, especially those with uh, in child poverty, with devices so that they can't, can access the internet? Ms. Tweel. Thank you for the question. Uh, and again, I am in vigorous agreement. <laughs> Having, uh, being able to access the internet is only one piece of the equation. We do, people do need the technology and beyond the technology, you need the skills as well to be able to, um, you know, make maximum use of the internet. Um, from a child welfare perspective, certainly any children that are in the care of the minister, uh, we do provide those children with iPads or the technology that they require to remain connected to their family members or friends. And um, so we do make sure that those children receive the, the technology that's appropriate for, for the child. Um, from an income assistance perspective, clients who um, are on the DCS caseload who are um, enrolled in any of our post-secondary pro supported programming through employment support services, they receive the appropriate technology to be able to participate fully in whatever post-secondary uh, path they have chosen. Um, we want to make sure that they complete that programming. Um, another example where we do provide things like iPads, um, at one point several months back, uh, we came to this committee to speak about the EDGE program, if you will recall. So the participants in EDGE also receive the appropriate technology to allow them to participate in the program. More broadly, uh, we are working very closely with libraries across the province um, to increase um, additional access points. We know libraries are very well used used by, by many, many people, in particular um, our clients and families and others living in poverty certainly access community supports like libraries to, to access the internet. And as I'm sure members are aware, libraries do provide um, technology that can be loaned as well um, in order to make sure that people can access the internet and uh, you know I think COVID has certainly demonstrated that access to internet is becoming increasingly more important and and so I guess I would just close my response by saying it is it is a priority um, that within government we are looking at across departments certainly Department of Education has provided devices to families who need them in order for their children to uh, access schooling remotely um, and but more broadly beyond even Department of Education as um, a table of deputy ministers, this is a topic of frequent discussion and of priority for us um, in terms of ensuring that citizens can fully participate um, in, in all that is, the whole world is moving to, an, to online and we want to make sure that we don't um, leave anyone behind because of an inability to access technology and secondarily the skills required to use that technology to its maximum advantage. Thank you. Ms. Coombs. Thank you very much. Um, in 2017, when Feed Nova Scotia Executive Director Nick Jennery appeared before this committee, he said that more of their funding comes from the donations from government employees than comes from actual government funding. Uh, and you mentioned the need to work with government, with um, other community partners. 
um, the CCPA report on family and child poverty stats state that charity is not a path to social and economic justice. And I have to agree, these organizations should be do can be doing great work in our communities, but shouldn't have to be fundraisers. They shouldn't have to go looking for grants. So with that, um, I ask for the nonprofit organizations that are doing this essential work, why isn't the government at least providing them the core funding that they need for this work? Ms. Twill. Thanks for the question. Uh, we do provide core funding for quite a number of organizations uh, right across the province. The organization that you've referenced, Feed Nova Scotia, Feed Nova Scotia has been self-sufficient um, from a donation perspective for a very long time. Um, and But that's I, I don't want to leave you with an impression that we don't work closely with Feed Nova Scotia. We do work very closely um, with Feed Nova Scotia. And in fact, through COVID, because of some of the challenges that that organization was facing, government did invest $2.3 million in with Feed Nova Scotia to ensure that they could access the food supply that they required. And beyond that, um, I, the committee may be interested to know that um, we, we actually sent staff to work at Feed Nova Scotia to ensure that their food um, distribution network was not disrupted. So we had a number of our employees actually volunteer um, to go and work, uh, and they worked there for quite a significant period of time to keep food, the food moving. So they, they did that because of how closely we work with Feed Nova Scotia. And we continue to work closely with Feed Nova Scotia. That is a very long-standing and productive and positive relationship. Supplementary, Ms. Coombs. Thank you. As I, uh, thank you. As I said before, um, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives Report on Family and Child Poverty it did state that charity is not a pathway to social and economic justice, and many of these, as I said before, these organizations could be doing a lot more needed work. But why are we relying on the charities to compensate for the failures of government? And when I say failures of government, I mean where government is actually funding programs rather than relying on these charities to fund programs and organizations with regards to poverty elimination. Ms. Twill. Thank you again for the question. Um, and as, as I stated in my previous response, we do fund, um, at Just Community Services alone, fund a number of organizations, provide core funding, provide program and project funding. When you look right across government, for example, at my previous uh, role at Communities, Culture and Heritage, you would note that a, a lot of organizations receive core funding through Communities, Culture and Heritage. I can't speak to all of the core funding that's provided by all of the various government departments, but a, a number of organizations, many, many right across this province, do receive core funding. From um, a donation perspective, to my earlier point, um, I do believe there is a role for all citizens, business, not-for-profit, there's a role in the, in the elimination of poverty in this province for all of those organizations to play. Um, so while we... Um, cannot be completely reliant on charity, certainly. I think the blend of government investment along with charity, charitable donations, um, fundraisers and the like, provide um, for the, an appropriate blend to continue to sustain organizations now and into the future. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. And, and I do really thank you for your question and want to reassure you that there are, a, there are a lot of organizations that do receive core funding through not solely community services, but through other government departments. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. My question is also for the department. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, the standard household rate. Uh, which is a, a change this year, based on information provided to our caucus by the department, we know that 16,150 households, more than half of the caseload for income assistance, will be considered to be in core housing needs, spending more than 30% of their income on shelter after the new standard household rate comes into effect. 100% of families in Nova Scotia who rely on government support for income live in poverty because the amount of income assistance falls far below the poverty line. And, and 
I know that none of us here think that that is appropriate or acceptable. How did the department determine the new standard household rates given that that, that standard household rate is not adequate or connected to the cost of living or any poverty measures? Ms. Twill. Thanks very much for your question. Um, so the standard household rate, um, I think, needs to be looked at in a larger context, along with all of the other investments that have been made in the entire portfolio of income assistance investments. So the standard household rate represents a $22.3 million investment on an annual basis. And I believe, as I referenced earlier, um, that um, increase to um, income, to the income assistance rate, represented either a 2% or a 5% increase for individuals on the caseload depending on their individual circumstances. Um, in addition to the changes made around uh, standard household rate, we also have the earned wage exemption um, for income assistance clients, which I've already referenced and I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and again, as I said earlier, it's ha that is having a significant um, impact. The wage exemption, the investment from the, a wage exemption perspective varies from year to year, but nets out at around $3 million on an annual basis. On average, the number continues to grow as more and more individuals join the workforce. We'll need to see what impact COVID may have had on that number, but it's a little early for us to tell. Um, I already referenced the exemption of child maintenance payments um, as well for income assistance clients. Um, the largest recipient of that are single mothers um, on our caseload. Um, I mentioned standard household rate already. We also, as you would be aware, have a free bus pass program within the um, Halifax Regional Municipality area, and we are looking at other options in other parts of the province to roll out uh, a bus pass program that won't and can't look the same way the Halifax program looks because of the infrastructure um, and the the way the bus system works here, but we are looking at other options from a transportation perspective. Uh, we also increased um, the personal, or rolled the personal items allowance and the personal allowance rate into an essentials rate and increased that from $100 to $280. And that is for individuals who may be residing in shelters or may not own or uh, rent um, on a permanent basis to help stabilize them until such time as they can move to more stable housing. All of those investments in their totality represent significant change within the system and the largest in totality, the largest um, investments in overhauling income assistance um, ever. Um, from a housing perspective, um, certainly my colleagues at housing um, are looking very closely, again, I'm, as I'm sure you're very aware, they're looking very closely at housing and particularly at on affordable housing. They've focused there. Um, so they support 2,500 households with rent supplements. An additional 500 supplements are planned. 200 of those will be in uh, Cape Breton. Um, they've invested to $20.5 million or will invest over five years for an integrated action plan to address homelessness. This is the single largest investment in homelessness prevention seen in this province. Um, you may be familiar with the down payment assistance program to try to help um, Nova Scotians with modest incomes to purchase their own homes. Um, also providing low income homeowners with more assistance so that they can stay in their own homes through home repair and renovation programs. And uh, their rental rehabilitation program is also underway to improve living conditions of lower income tenants. In terms of the other part of your question, uh, how did we arrive at decisions around standard household rate? Working in consultation with our stakeholders and advocates, we looked at a number of options um, as we were considering um, making changes to income assistance. We landed on the standard household rate to um, provide both uh, a, a albeit modest, increase in the income assistance rates. But I think more importantly, we, we have structurally changed the way income assistance works so that clients have more control over how they spend um, 
their funds. We're trying to move from um, a system that, um, you know, when it was created was more dare I say paternalistic, I guess, uh, less control, less focus, less control on the part of the client, more control held on the part of the administrator of the program. We need to shift that so that it becomes, um, it's a relationship, that it is not just an individual is not contacting community services solely because they are in need of income assistance. Um, but rather they come to us because they are in need of assistance and we then look at which income supports can we provide but more broadly what other things can we do to support um, that family or that individual to improve their their quality of life. And that may mean referring them to a career Nova Scotia Centre. It may mean making sure that they know about some of the programs that are offered through the community college or what employment supports are available um, to them through the department or through other community partners. Um, that is the shift that we're trying to make and working very closely with our stakeholders and advocates, I have no doubt that they will continue to push us to make sure that we do um, keep the client and those families at the forefront of uh, all of the work um, that we are doing in the department. Supplementary, Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. I will say that I, I disagree with... Um, uh, tabulating the, the cost of the lack of clawback of uh, child support payments and, uh, and earned income as an investment from the government. I, 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 I just, I, that, that is one way of accounting for it, but I, I find it uh, disingenuous to calculate uh, a decision to not claw back people's earned income um, as a government investment. Um, I appreciate those comments, uh, and you did reference uh, rent supplements. Um, I have a great concern that as we roll out more rent supplements, um, the lack of rent control and the lack of investment in social market housing is um, creating a you know a lineup for that for a need for a rent supplement as fast as the government can roll out rent supplements. So. Um, I am wondering uh, what the evaluation of the poverty reduction blueprint, um, what those early re evaluation results are saying about the impact of a lack of uh, social market housing, uh, including in Cape Breton, where I, I know uh, New Dawn has, has done some innovative work to increase uh, the the social market housing, so non-profit housing stock, but where um, the public housing stock, I understand, has not been invested in in a, in a long time in a significant way, and where municipalities, because they're still paying some amount towards that um, rather dilapidated um, public housing stock, are, are not are not very uh, willing to invest in, in expanding that social market stock. And so um, what, is the, what is the impact of, um, of, of that housing situation? Um, and including the impact in terms of uh, families or ESIA clients actually staying in hotels, which I know is a significant issue in, in the HRM area. I don't know if it is in the CB, in Cape Breton as well. Ms. Twill. Thank you again for the question. Um, the poverty reduction blueprint, so we're just starting to get some of the evaluation results in, and I believe, as I referenced earlier, um, the evaluation are pointing to, so I was looking for my notes in my book here so I could point specifically, but um, the uh, evaluation results are showing um, some very positive, some promising practice, but, but from a challenge perspective, showing that issues around transportation are paramount in many parts of the province, including um, challenges in HRM, um, on the outskirts of HRM, where we, it's not, there's not uh, public transit that routinely serves those areas. Um, so transportation is certainly an issue. Housing is absolutely um, an issue in some pockets of the province, 
absolutely. Um, and will be something that we'll need to look at and make recommendations on as we work into the last year of the poverty reduction blueprint. Um, as well, uh, some of the evaluation results are showing that looking at um, wraparound supports versus sort of single interventions, kind of um, you know in and out interventions, do not have the same impact as a wraparound longer term. Um, intervention would have that sees um, whether it's a caseworker from community services or involvement with um, a community-based organization sees a long-term involvement um, versus coming in in a crisis and pulling back out. Um, the um, evaluation results are showing that long-term engagement is what will net the most significant um, impact and that it needs to be relationship, not, not transaction-based, if you will. Um, let's see. Um, other things that are um, showing promise include adapting program and service delivery. And this speaks to my earlier comment about um, the opportunity, if you will, that COVID afforded us to change the way we deliver service. Um, Drop-in sessions versus forcing people to have a multi-week kind of commitment, allowing people to participate as they see fit in different interventions are helping. Having um, every door as a right door, so multiple access points to access supports, whether that be to talk about housing need or income need or education needs, having multiple doors that people can enter um, is showing promise as um, netting better and greater results. Um, offering free and subsidized programs and services to individuals to um, help them meet their goals, certainly showing promise as well. Um, and, and cultivating culturally responsive partnerships with organizations so that we are not discounting the impact of uh, systemic racism or, or um, impacts that have been the result of either gender or um, race uh, over the course of sometimes multiple generations. Um, hot you uh, talked about hotel stays. So hotel stays in Cape Breton are very low. Um, hotel stays in Halifax, we only use a hotel as a as an option for our clients for a couple of reasons. One, if someone is coming um, to for a medical appointment from somewhere else in the province, we will sometimes house them in a hotel because they're here for a very short period of time. And um, to support that client, um, given the nature of why they've come to Halifax, we will sometimes support them to, for a hotel stay. Sometimes we also um, will provide um, a hotel stay for our clients who require additional um, support so perhaps they can't be accommodated um, in a shelter arrangement if if they've reached that point um, and they may not have any other housing options we um, will then provide some support through partnerships with a, a hotel until they are stabilized and we can work with a housing support worker to, to find them more stable and permanent housing um, I mean, our goal always is to have people in sustainable, long-term housing. We work with our clients very closely. Um, any of our clients who are in, for example, rental arrears, um, we work with them to come up with a plan and we'll support them in working with their landlord to try to avoid um, eviction um, because we don't obviously we don't want to see that happen we want our clients to be safely and securely um, housed um, so we we work hard um, to try to provide that kind of support and you know i'll come full circle now in terms of my reference to having a more human and relational based system. We are trying to take a system that is very um, sort of regulation heavy and rules based and make it more flexible, make it more adaptable to the needs of our clients. Um, we want our caseworkers and our social workers to build relationships with those they serve so that they better understand the challenge and what the um, steps may be to help that client, that individual, that family move to be at more stable housing or a more 
just more stability within their family, whatever that looks like for them. That is a fundamental shift uh, within the department. And that's not because employees of the department didn't always want to work that way. Our policies, programs, regulations were structured such that there was limited flexibility inside of those programs. We're, we're working, and it is a work in progress. It is not perfect, and we have a long way to go. But we are working to make changes that acknowledge the very complex lives that many of our clients lead to try to be a, a safe place where they can turn to when they are in need of assistance. Um, but just as a reminder as well, some of the individuals that we're talking about um, today, some of the families are not on the uh, income assistance caseload. In fact, many are not. Um, the vast majority of our caseload are not, in fact, families. They are individuals, single individuals. Um, that doesn't mean that all those other families don't need our attention and our support, and which is why we're working horizontally across government with all other departments and with our partners in community to um, try to bring attention to this issue and to look at what levers government has to um, increase the level of support that those families receive. Uh, thank you. Just a bit of a time check here. We've got about 16 minutes. I'm not sure we're going to make it to everyone on the list here. I've got six more. We're going to move to just a single question without a supplementary, if that's okay with folks, to just try and get as many questions in as we can. Mr. Comer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my first question is for Joanna. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. <laughs> and thanks for all the great work that you and your organization does uh, in Cape Breton for families that really need it most. Uh, I know due to time, I'm going to kind of cut right to the chase here. I know you're, you're very well uh, versed and have a lot of knowledge in this, in this area, uh, especially in Cape Breton. Uh, and something I think about is uh, the lack of, you know, of the ability for us to accurately evaluate, you know, childhood poverty from a Cape Breton perspective. So I would just like to hear your thoughts potentially on a, you know, an all-party task force, you know, with Cape Breton MLAs, key stakeholders such as yourself and Lynn, and obviously community members and trying to create an innovative approach, I guess, and finally being able to move the needle and, and reduce childhood poverty uh, in Cape Breton. Ms. Latulip Rochon. Thank you for that. And, you know, as I sit here and I listen to, to folks that I really do believe are, are working really hard and um, very familiar with long, long lists of programs and services that are available um, in heartwarming kinds of ways to our families, I can't help but be saddened, I guess, because it, it highlights for me the, the disconnect between perhaps lots of things that we think we are doing to make a difference. And while the list of program and supports may be growing, uh, and while we may be making changes that we should have made 10 or 15 or 20 years ago now, probably we're still 15 years behind even when we advance a little bit. I appreciate the, um, the question, and I think that something is obviously very needed to bridge the disconnect between what we can comfortably say we are doing and truthfully say we're doing, yet the, the six particular situations, I could have brought you 60, I could have brought you 600, okay? These are not the six worst things that happened in the last year or in the last 27. This is commonplace, common parts to our work. So whatever it takes, I would say, we ought to be willing to do to sort of look at what happens between transformative changes in legislation and the family that's still hungry or cold. There's, there's something wrong. There's something very wrong. And one of the... Um, one of the um, hopeful, perhaps, opportunities that the Deputy Minister and I had a chance to talk about last week was a dedicated connect between our services, not that we don't have departmental people and great relationships, but when somebody is living this situation and does not feel able, or when because of turnover or burnout or not enough staff or COVID, the people just aren't there or the people are not hearing. I mean, so we need to do something because I think 
really, as I'm sitting here, I, I'm, I'm just really heavy with the disconnect between, you know, we can walk away and think that, that we have programs and services and we're human relational based systems. Surely, to goodness, we've tried to be that all along. Is that a new thing? You know, and, and I think our, our families, that's not the lived experience of the families that we're working with. I guess just simply put for whatever reason. Some of the barriers are if you have the authority to take the child into your care, this is not a system where people feel they can go forward and say, I don't have food, I don't have a bed, I have rats because people feel like that kind of honest conversation is going to result in the child being taken into care. And so our families are not feeling. So in some instances, I really acknowledge there is more help available, but that's a very real barrier for people and people can't access. So having a, um, having a committee for me is, is great if it's a committee about doing something. I, um, I'm beyond, I guess, in 27 years. I don't want to admire the problem. I'm an accountant by background. I can give all kinds of numbers and statistics and those kinds of things. Um, I just want to, I just want to make a difference for our families and some kind of an all party committee that actually assesses and gets taken seriously where those disconnects happen from these great programs and services and this transformative program process and not seeing a whole lot of difference on the ground. Albeit, I will say we are seeing some differences in some areas, but I'll tell you, there is no housing availability. Landlords know very well when any rate goes up or any standardized form, and when we start talking about people having choices about where to spend their money when they don't have enough money. There's not enough money. I don't know why or how, but there's not real choice. If you have $100 to spend any way you want, and you've got $1,000 in bills, I don't think you're sleeping comfortably at night. There's just not enough money, and there is a disconnect. I absolutely enjoy, as our organization, I think one of the strongest, most positive relationships with our colleagues in the Department of Community Services, both on a provincial and a, a very local level, and I celebrate that. But it's not working, folks. We've got to do better. Mr. McGuire. Thank you for being here today. I, I do... Um, uh, you know, there were some comments made earlier about this. This isn't a complicated issue, and I would argue that it is a complicated issue. There's, it's not uh, as easy as just saying we're going to do this and everything's solved. And, and I look at housing. I look at, you know, I would look around this room, and I would, I would guess, and I look around this chamber, and I would guess there's not many people that have lived in poverty in their life um, and have actually really experienced it. Uh, we want to talk about housing. Uh, you know, there are there are a whole host of issues around housing, uh, including gentrification of neighbors. Neighborhoods, neighborhoods that used to be affordable, that uh, individuals moved into, and now we see this in HRM, we see it in uh, Fairview, we see it in the north end of Halifax and other areas where the, the prices of those places have skyrocketed. And I remember when I was young, those areas used to be affordable. When, when I was young uh, and I was 16 years old looking for a place to, to live, uh, where you looked was Dartmouth, Fairview, Spryfield, and uh, the north end of Halifax. Well, most of those areas are no longer affordable. Um, so there's a whole host of reasons why we're in the position that we're in. It's very frustrating to me when I, when I, when I hear things like, um, you know, uh, preventing the clawback for, uh, is not working. Well, uh, Department of Community Services went out and did extensive consultation. I, know, I, don't, I can't speak to Cape Breton, but I can speak to here to HRM where, you know, you had Tim Crooks or Tim involved from Phoenix House. You had Shelter Nova Scotia involved. You had Adsum House involved. You had all these organizations involved. And on top of it, you had people that were directly impacted that came to these meetings. And one of the things they talked about was the clawback. So for someone on this committee to sit here and act like that's not a real investment, they haven't talked to anyone, anyone that's been impacted by that. Because as soon as that was pulled back and that wasn't taken back dollar for dollar, we had a flood of people from not just my community, but people in this room who, uh, whose uh, constituents were impacted that contacted my office to talk about how this was a blessing. 
and it was something they've asked for for a long, long, long time. So we can all sit around here and pat ourselves on the back and say we're doing all a great job, but the truth of the matter is there's still poverty in Nova Scotia. There's still poverty. There's still housing issues. There's still poverty. Anyone that goes to bed at night that has to worry about a roof over their head and anyone that has, goes to bed at night dealing with poverty, that's a failed... Uh, that's a failure on their behalf. How do we eliminate poverty? Uh, if, we would, if, we, if we had the magic bullet and we could snap our fingers, there's not a person in government and outside of government that wouldn't do that. What I'm frustrated about is we're sitting here uh, as somebody who's lived in poverty, who's, who's had to cash a $25 food check, uh, who has had to live on the streets, who's had to use shelters, who's had to use food banks in the past, what I'm frustrated about is 30 years on after, you know, 20 years on, we're still talking about this. We're still talking about the same issues. Um, so what, I, just, I think we need an update on where we're at and why haven't governments, why are we sitting here after a conservative, NDP, liberal governments, we've had every brand of government but green. And here we are. So why do we have, uh, um, the levels of poverty that we have in Cape Breton, why do we have the levels of poverty we have here in HRM? And I, and you know, there are things to say that that, and I will, I, I mean, I will acknowledge, like we, we're we're sitting on the, I, I I think we're sitting in the forefront of this in, in the community that I'm in, and I can tell you that some of these programs that the federal government have put forward, in particular along with the provincial government, have lifted a lot of children and people out of poverty. They've helped give them more options. We know of people that are are now receiving thousands and thousands extra. Uh, because of federal and provincial programs, so we do have to give some credit for some of the stuff that's being done. Uh, before those programs, uh, those individuals were coming into all of our offices, uh, probably on a weekly basis. Um, you know, in my office, we keep a, a record of who comes in and out. Uh, if we don't hear from someone, especially somebody who in the past has had a history of being um, uh, struggling with food uh, security or or financing, finances, we contact them to see how they're doing. And I would say a large percentage of them are doing a lot better, um, just from our own feedback that we're, and it doesn't matter what anyone on this, uh, in, on this side of the aisle thinks or says. You know, if you're talking to some of those people on the ground and they're saying like these programs are helping, then they're helping. Um, but the truth is, is there's more that needs to be done. Why are we still talking about this? And what is the department doing? Ms. Twill, I think that was a question for, <laughs> Thank might you. be for everyone, mm -hmm. might be for all Nova Scotians, but anyway, Ms. Uh, Twill. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, and um, I would agree that um, this, has, this is a long-standing conversation that has been had by many, many individuals who've come before me, certainly in the seat that I currently occupy, and, and certainly successive governments for many, many, many years. Um, poverty is a long-standing issue um, in Nova Scotia, in, in Canada um, as well. Uh, certainly we know that rates in Nova Scotia, as I believe I said at the outset, our current rate of poverty in Nova Scotia is sitting, sits at 13.3%. That does represent a decrease since 2008, where we were at uh, around 16%. Um, but that rate, the decrease is too slow, and um, and then the rate is still too high um, to, to the points that I believe you were making. Um, I've, I've walked through a number of the changes that we've been making within the Department of Community Services, and, and I've tried to highlight, I think, some other, um, what I would describe as kind of disruptors in the system. So universal pre-primary is a, is a disruptor in the system, but that's going to take 15 17 years for us to see the impact, this, the, the true impact of, of that. I talked about the changes around the basic personal amount from an income tax perspective. That likewise will have an impact. The Nova Scotia Child Benefit Investments um, will have an impact, as will the, um, the Canada Child Benefit. All of those pieces taken together will 
have an impact along with changes to standard household rates, some of the exemptions that are now in place. All of those things in combination will have an impact. The other pieces I think that we need um, are aspects that I spoke about earlier. It's the wraparound support. It is long-term investments in families. It is per hooking them up with, connecting them to other services that can help them improve um, improve their personal circumstance that can support them in raising their children. Um, there are some positive things that we certainly are seeing. Our new intakes from a youth perspective, youth age 19 to 24, our youth intakes are declining. That is that is positive. Um, we do have um, the number of dependents who, um, whose parents were on income assistance. The rate of those dependents who are transitioning themselves into income assistance is declining. That is very positive. Is it declining fast enough? or as fast as we would want it to? Absolutely not. But it does, I think, demonstrate that some of the interventions that we are undertaking, this work around prevention, this work around creating new, um, very focused programming from an employment support perspective is working. And the investments that we will now uh, make, stepping up our investments around prevention and early intervention, um, will absolutely have an impact we need to get to the point where all of those things are kind of working in unison and we've just not we just haven't been there yet but flipping a system like the income assistance system, like the child welfare system, flipping that system so that we put more of the focus on the front end, on the pre preventative side, on the wraparound support side is going to take some, some time. And, um, and I, th I believe we're on the right path. We have to continue on this path and continue to be innovative and creative and work collaboratively with our partners, such as those that are here today, and, and, maintain, and, and maintain a focus. And I said this at the beginning, and I, I will say it again. We all have to focus on this. So the fact that this committee brought this item to be discussed today is I think is really significant. It's very important. We have to focus here, and all Nova Scotians need to understand that if one family is living in poverty, then it impacts them too. Thank you very much. Uh, we've basically come to uh, the conclusion of our time for questions. My apologies to Ms. Coombs, Mr. Jessen, Mr. Horn, and Ms. DiCostanzo, who had hoped to squeeze in uh, some questions this morning. Um, uh, I'd like now to uh, open it to our witnesses for any closing remarks. Uh, who would like to start? Ms. McCarran. Uh, Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that this is, it is quite impressive to sit in a room with so many people that are passionate about helping to fight poverty, helping to move uh, children and families out of poverty. Um, as an organization that funds these not-for-profit organizations, I'd love to have the answers of where I should be investing our money that's going to have the greatest impact. I don't. I'm trying. Um, I'm, I'm trying to collaborate and bring, uh, leverage the money that we raise in our community with to, to, uh, to get other government supports to, to make it go farther, to make it stretch farther so that we can have more of an impact. Um, we've with the COVID, we've spent over $600,000 in 51 communities across Cape Breton, helping over 28,000 people. I have right now another 120,000 that the feds have given me to spend before the end of November, and I have over $300,000 in asks. So how are we, I mean, I have a board that's gonna help us pick where that money goes, but is it going to go to the right place? Is it going to have the impact that we're hoping for? Um, I think every time you, you put money and in, invest in something that you're, you're hoping it's going to have a good return. That's the whole point of an investment. Um, so I, I think it's great that there's that this that I've been invited for this conversation, and I think it's great that there's people talking about it, and it's certainly on the radar for what we do and how we do it. Um, and I agree, if we had a silver bullet, I'd be I'd be the first one with paying for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but. I think the other part of it is that there are gaps, as, as Joanna mentioned, and we have to be maybe um, more aware of what those gaps are. So 
things that I'm finding in the nonprofit sector is their capacity to collect data. They're on the ground. They're, like, the executive directors are doing the work, so they don't have time on the side of the desk to start collecting data and doing evaluations and all of those things that re are required in order for us to say, well, what's working and what's not. So we are, as a United Way, we're also helping that not-for-profit sector to figure out how to do that data collection, that evaluation, to make sure that we're, we're identifying what the gaps are. Um, I'll give you a quick example. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but there was, we had a program where we were offering free dental care to, to folks in Cape Breton. I thought it was great. Dentists were stepping up. Hygienists were stepping up. We had 150 names on the list, and the week before, people started canceling for free dental care. So I have a person in my office who has lived experience. Thank God for her, because I said to her, what's going on? I have to know what's going on. Why is this not working? She said, well, they're embarrassed. A lot of these people haven't been to the dentist in 10 years. They're scared that they're going to be embarrassed sitting in a chair to justify why they haven't been to the dentist in 10 years. Some of them are scared they're going to have a copay and they don't want to stand there in front of a receptionist to explain that they're actually getting this for free. There was, it, was, it was all about confidence and, and insecurities and I thought, okay, so we're expecting people to run before we've taught them how to walk. So we backed up our programs and started to try and do things a little differently so that they could still get the free dental care. And one of the things that we were talking about is if we, I think it stops at 14 or maybe 16, I'm, I always get those numbers mixed up, but it, it have some sort of continuum so that at 14 or 16, once a year, they get to the dentist and we start paying for that so that, but, that they don't miss for 10 years and they're not embarrassed. I mean, with COVID, it was, it was a year for me, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, it's going to ask me about flossing. You know, and so those are the kinds of things that we have to think about, where are the gaps and, and services. But I, any, I just wanted to say thank you, and like I say, I, I, I have money to spend, and I can <laughs> ask corporate for more money. I just need to know where to put it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Latulip Rochon. Thank you again. I guess I'll go back to the, the comment that I just made because I just feel it's, it's such an important piece for me in my experience here. There just is a huge disconnect that I'm, I'm feeling quite heavily between what we think we're doing, what we're intending to do, and what the actual impact on the ground is being. And, and so just to say that we have a lot of families that are working really, really hard to try to do the very best that they can for themselves and for their children and coming up against significant barriers. Some of those barriers, a topic we haven't talked about, but perhaps some thought could be put into the um, turnover rate that's experienced within our child protection system and the fact that we most likely don't have very experienced workers at that level working with families. And so if that's a, an entry point into the, the, the work, uh, then you're entering, you're, you're having people come in at entry, with entry level skills to the most complex families that exist. And that's a huge problem. And so getting at things like, what are we doing around professional development? What are we doing to keep senior people on the ground? If we've got really complicated situations, then we need our best experienced people um, doing the work. So while everybody is, is well intentioned, we end up with things like like, and I'll just give you this example that was shared with me earlier or early last week. A pregnant woman, okay, on her way to the hospital, supposed to be going to the hospital to deliver her baby, but stops from going to the hospital to, to connect with somebody in the family resource center because a child welfare worker told her if she didn't have a change table, her baby was going to get taken into care. Now, that's, I know that's not true. I know that's not a reason to take a child into care. And in fact, you can't fall off the floor. It's a great place to change the baby sometimes, okay? But that's not what that woman needed to hear to have comfort because she knows that the authority exists to do that. So the cost of not having experienced, professionally developed families creates situations that are very difficult 
for our families to get through. So even when the services are there, the barriers are there. I'd suggest we look at how do we retain staff, how do we retain senior staff and experienced staff in our nonprofits when we can't compete with regard to wages or benefits or you know nobody has a pension plan really, any of those kinds of things. And so I think there are other systemic things that we need to look at. I love the idea of having a systematic way to evaluate the initiatives that we put forward as government. And I say we as government, because it is us. So we as government put forward initiatives, and maybe we think something. I think we have to get closer to knowing whether those pieces are working or not. And I'm happy to continue the work to try to get there without, like I say, more admiring of the problem. That's really getting old. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, DM Twill. Uh, I'll, I'll be really quick in the interest of time. I know you're watching the clock. I just really want to say thank you. I'm um, very heartened to be here to have this conversation today and, um, and absolutely support the perspectives of my colleagues. There is much more we need to do and, um, and I believe that if we continue to work together and keep a dialogue open and most importantly involve the voice of those that we serve, um, that we will see success and we will continue um, to chip away at, at these rates that we were talking about today, but most importantly make life better for Nova Scotia families who are struggling. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of all the committee, I'd like to thank the witnesses today for both uh, for giving voice to those in poverty and uh, and uh, touching on the, the many complex issues that uh, are part of the, the poverty equation that uh, our province and really all of Canada are dealing with. So again, thank you. And uh, you can uh, uh, leave your seats. We've got a a, a few, few minutes of committee business uh, to wrap up, and uh, again, thank you. Okay, on committee business, uh, we have correspondence. Uh, the Department of Community Services uh, uh, provided a letter res uh, with information requested from the October 16th meeting. Uh, if we're uh, satisfied with that re response, um, uh, can I have agreement to post that on the committee, committee web, web page? Thank you very much. Secondly, the 2020 annual report, uh, that draft has been circulated to committees. No uh, comments were received. I'd ask for a motion to approve uh, the 2020 annual report for the Standing Committee on Community Services. Mr. Jessam. So moved. Thank you. D discussion, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, motion is carried, thank you. The next meeting date will be December 10th uh, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The Department of Community Services and Family Services of Eastern Nova Scotia, uh, the topic Family Plus program, and we will also uh, be setting, uh, doing the agenda setting for the next uh, uh, six meetings. Mr. Costanza. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just see on my paper here it says December 8, not 10. Do we have something different? I think it's December 10th. I think it was moved from the 3rd to the 10th, is my recollection. I'll just turn to the clerk here who... It's the 8th. It is, is the 8th? It is the okay. 8th. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. December 8th, then, at, uh, at 9 a.m. So if there's no further business, uh, Mr. Calmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, based on the what, what, what I would consider expert testimony, I guess, from the frontline workers in Cape Breton. Uh, I would move to ask the committee uh, that we write a letter to the Premier uh, requesting an all-party committee comprised of Cape Breton MLAs who will be tasked specifically uh, with reducing childhood poverty in Cape Breton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any comments? No comments from the committee? All in favor? Opposed? Nay, motion is defeated. Thank you. With that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. We'll reconvene on December 8th. Thank you very much.